Today, suppose there are two kinds of people in the world. Welcome to Coffee with Kramer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Kramer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. I had a friend a couple of decades ago, maybe more than that, more like three decades ago, uh, who used to always uh, make this joke. He, his, his crack would be, uh, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who say there are two kinds of people in the world and those who don't. Uh, I, <laughs> I get the, and I, I actually find that interesting because we often say there are two kinds of people in the world and then we make these enormous statements categorizing people into what they are. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a tautological statement on one side. Uh, you know, it's, there's no way it couldn't be true. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those who produce my, the episodes for my podcast and those who don't. Uh, of course, one type of those people, there's only one of. Uh, Daisy Reynolds, who's sitting over there. And then there are a bajillion of the other kinds of people. But, you know, that's just uh, two kinds of people in the world. So obviously, tautologically, you can make two kinds of people in the world just by choosing to put somebody into one category and somebody into the other category. That, But that's not what we do. What we do <laughs> is we generalize about people. It's a really handy tool for human nature, uh, the way we relate to each other. And, I, and I'm not speaking psychologically, but more sociologically. Uh, we inherently and necessarily group people together because we, we, don't, we just don't have the capacity, and I don't mean intellectual capacity. We don't have the emotional or relational capacity or just the intentionality to treat every single person with all of the individual characteristics that that person has. So we need to say, well, he's on that team, or uh, she acts like those people over there, and we start categorizing people, and in more negative terms, we pigeonhole them. So we, do, so we take a quick glance at a person, and we suddenly say they're just like these other people that we have met. And then we extrapolate from what we've actually experienced with them, like for, as, for instance, we would do with the facial expression that we get from someone. Uh, we see this facial expression in other people. We saw that facial expression, and then they hit us, or and then they were, you know, whatever. And we see that same facial expression, and we say, oh, that, that, they must be about to hit me, or they must, and we extrapolate into other areas as well. So it's only natural, just by the inductive way that we live, it's only natural that we would look at an individual and then compare them to other individuals who've been similar to them in one way or another. And, and, and obviously, the similarities that are most obvious whether that's visually or auditory or something else, we're going to draw, we're going to uh, sort of coalesce our opinions around that first, and then as we get to know a person better, they completely change because we realize that even though they look just like that person, they're completely different. Super easy point for me. My mom is a twin, and she and her twin are identical twins all the time they will be confronted or confronted. They will be approached by people who will say, oh, I'm so glad to see you. And it's somebody they don't know at all because it's somebody who knows their twin. And they look just alike. Uh, you know, when I was a baby, they looked alike to me. But, you know, as I got older, there was no way on earth I would have confused them at all uh, because I know the difference in the personality and the things that are behind the scenes between them. So I love them both. They're both fine, but they're just completely different people. And my mom's better. But, you know, but I mean, also that has to do with offspring, you know. And I love my cousins, too. They're great. But anyway, I should move on. The point is uh, that <laughs> what I want to do is talk about uh, the ways that we categorize people that I think are in some ways useful and in other ways limiting. But they're all a part of how we function in the world. We, we categorize people into, uh, well, we categorize people. I'll just leave it there. 
So what I want to do is uh, follow a pattern where we establish a context within which we divide people into two groups and then talk about one kind and talk about the other kind just to identify how we split these groups up. And I think these are common ways of thinking. It's not like I've done some uh, deep psychological research study on, on establishing these kinds. These are just 60 years of conversations with people and how we generally categorize people. That's all. And then I want to throw a wrench in the works on each of these contexts, within each of these contexts. So, for instance, we'll start with um, this one. Priority. Uh, The way people prioritize what they are doing, how they establish a a priority, what's most important to them. And uh, the reason I bring this one up, it's it's convenient for me, is we have a, a professor at Criswell College. I'm the president at Criswell College. We have a a professor here who served uh, for a decade or so overseas uh, in a multicultural context uh, where he, he, he served in Israel. And so he speaks Arabic and he speaks modern Hebrew, and he led a, a, a diversity uh, session for us and all of our staff and faculty just so we could do a better job of serving students who came from overseas or students who were coming from a different culture, uh, in you know, in all of our offices, because if you don't understand people from a different culture, you might take something they're doing as rude when they're not intending to be rude at all, or you know, and so on. So we had a little diversity session. We said, so how can we make sure that we're attending to the needs of our students well? And we did this oh, a long time ago. I mean, ten or twelve years ago. Anyway, it was a really interesting workshop, and he did a great job with it. Uh, But what he introduced was primarily, he just introduced one particular cultural difference uh, that people have, and and this is also true about individuals within a culture, but he was doing it between cultures, and he said there were some who prioritize prioritize their lives around time, and he gave examples of uh, games that are this way. Football is prioritized around time, you know, to the to the very second. Basketball, how many how many shots can you get in in those last two seconds of the game? You know how it is. Two seconds takes the last hour of the game. I don't know why anybody watches the first fifty nine minutes and fifty eight seconds, but anyway, the I'm just kidding. It's a great sport. The point is that it's very time based, and almost all of American sports are that way. There is an exception, obviously, baseball. Although there's always pressure to put a time limit on baseball. And tennis, by the way, had that pressure also and changed its rules uh, a a couple of decades ago in order to uh, comply with the urgency of time so you wouldn't have any more three-day matches between players and so on like that. So there's nothing like cricket going on over here because our culture is largely time-based. But that's also true about individuals. And the way we see that is people who are very punctual, right? So individuals, forget the culture in general, just think about the people who are around you. You have some people who are punctual to a fault. Uh, my dad was this way. Uh, you know, he, he, you may not know this. He passed away last year. But as long as he was alive, if he was going to go somewhere, he was going to be there 30 minutes early. Uh, and and I was the same way. I grew up the same way. If I could get there early, I wanted to be there early. The time before anyone else got there was great time alone to begin with. And I didn't have to stress out about being late, which would have been anathema because I grew up in my dad's home and no way on earth was I ever going to be late for anything. Uh, and what, and you know, my, my dad's opinion of people on the other side of that and the opinion I've heard from a lot of people uh, who are very time sensitive and aware of promptness and the importance of being on time to things is that people who are not like that are irresponsible or lazy or disrespectful or something along those lines. It's really funny that it, it, it did seem to me that if someone was late for a meeting with me, they might be disrespectful. That, that, that's really not something built into my response when people are late. I work near downtown Dallas. Criswell College is near downtown Dallas in Old East Dallas. And so we just know. I mean, you, if you have to get on a street here, you may not ever emerge from the street. Uh, so we're aware that there are, t- there are limitations on people's control of time. But at, the, but, but at the same time, I grew up knowing you, you factor that in. It doesn't matter if you're going to have a day-long uh, crisis come up and there's a riot and the entire world around you crumbles. You should have figured for that before you left the house so that you'd get there on time, you know. That's how we thought about it. But, but I will say this, I, ha- I have realized over time <laughs> that if I'm, if I'm being prompt, that means there are times that I have to cut other people off. 
hey, man, I, I have another meeting coming up. And so I'm going to have to, you know, I've, I've just got to wrap this up. and I'm so sorry to leave. And so when I'm doing that with somebody who's just, you know, they're just telling a joke or something like that, that's one thing. But when you're doing it with someone who's spilling their life's guts to you, uh, it seems a little cold uh, to that person. And my point is that the categorization that we want to use is to say, well, obviously, I'm a person who cares about time. So people who care about time, they're respectful and responsible. And, and they, you know, they understand things. They're, they're productive. You know, they're good people. Those people who don't care about time, there must be something wrong with them. But the reality is people who are on the other side of it aren't just people who don't care about time. They've prioritized something else. And in a lot of cultures, by the way, and in individuals, this is the truth, uh, what they prioritized is actually people, which which uh, I know this sounds odd because you're saying, well, I, I want to be on time so that I can be respectful of other people. Really? Or is it is it more like me? You know, I want to be on time so I can say I was on time and so I can keep to, to the schedule that I've set for the day and so on. Now, I, I'm not saying I'm disrespectful of people by being on time. I'm just saying, you know, I don't have to prejudice it against those who've made their priority not the clock but the people that they're meeting with. Uh, I, I've been told by a bunch of different people about Dr. Criswell, the namesake of our college. Uh, I've been told about him after church. He would preach, and this man pre pastored the largest church, the largest Baptist church in America for a long time. People came from around the country to hear him preach. They would schedule their vacation to come to Dallas just so they could hear him preach. Huge crowds of people every week. And after church, you know what he did? He would finish preaching. And then he would go down to the front, and he would stand there with a long line of people waiting to shake hands and greet Dr. W.A. Criswell. And you say, well, that's enough. Wow, that's amazing. He wasn't rushed out by security so that he could be safe because he's so important. He would stand there, and he would talk to the person who was in front of him, looking only at the person who was in front of him until they were finished. He had people around him who tried to handle them and push them off, and he would keep them in front of him and talk to them until they were finished. And then he would talk to the next person until they were finished. And he would talk to the next person until they were finished, until the line was gone, and sometimes long into the afternoon. That's a person who cares more about people than the clock. And this was a guy who had a pretty disciplined schedule. He woke up every morning and gave his entire morning to studying and preparing his sermons and so on. And he spent the afternoons exercising, blah, blah, blah. And he spent the evenings working with people and taking care of counseling sessions and all that stuff that you do as a pastor. So it's, a you know, he, but he cared about people. That's the thing. There are, there are other people who, you know, when they're doing that, they can't help but just look over the shoulder of the person they're talking to. Uh, where's my next appointment? You know, I've, I've only got so much time and I've got it. They're prioritizing time. I'm saying that as a person who does prioritize time. I, I, I am very time-oriented, very schedule-oriented. Uh, I do value that. But I have learned that, and I have, I have children who are like this. I mean, their lives are about people. And they will, and I'm very proud of that, very proud, that they take their time to, to just get to know a person. And if that means they're going to be late for their next appointment, yeah, they're just late for their next appointment. Their priority is the person who's in front of them right now. And I'm not, I'm not saying you have to live your life that way. I'm saying if there are two kinds of people in the world, our recognition that there are those two kinds of people in the world is not a recognition that requires us to prioritize one of those groups over the other and say, well, these people are a little better than those other people. And so in our response to others, uh, this is the wrench in the works that I would throw in. What you will discover, I think what we ought to acknowledge and discover, is that it's not as simple as we'd like to think when we're talking about how we relate to other people directly. So for instance, if I created a parallel category to the time and people priorities, uh, it would be people who are impervious to peer pressure, you know, and which I would equate uh, or at least make equivalent with those who are time-based, more time-sensitive. Uh, you know, I'm not going to give in to what other people want me to do. I'm, I'm largely that way. I'm not completely impervious, obviously, as I'll point out in just a moment. But I am, I'm not inclined to give in to the pressure that people put on me to do something or not do something, and I've never been that way. Uh, I am, you know, what I'd like to think is that that makes me the opposite of those people pleasers, you know, the ones who just want to do whatever it takes to make other people happy. But that's just a critique based on the fact that I'm impervious to peer pressure, or I'd like to think that I'm impervious to peer pressure. 
the reality is that all of us have an emotional connection with and even dependency on other people. And what a lot of us who think, oh, I, I'm not, I don't give in to peer pressure, we're actually looking for peer acceptance in some kind of ability to say, oh, see, I'm above the crowd, I'm above the fray. And in the same, and, and no one, no one's genuinely impervious to peer pressure except maybe a psychopath. And we use the word psychopath for them because, or sociopath, because something's wrong. You know, it should matter to you how you fit in with other people. And, and so I won't go into all the discussion about how norms get etched into us culturally and so on like that. And so the reality is all of us are shaped by the people around us. And I'm not saying by that there's not an absolute morality. There is. That's why I said I'm not going to get into it because I knew you'd drag me into this philosophical discussion we don't have time for right now. But the point is that all of us learn things from other people and are shaped by the way other people act. The courtesies that we have, you know, in greeting one another and how we, whether we shake hands or wave our hands at each other or nod our heads at each other or embrace each other with a hug or any of that kind of stuff, it's, it's universal that human beings greet one another, but it's not universal how we express those greetings. We learn that from the people around us, which means we're not impervious uh, to the influences of other people. It's our manners of expressing come from other people. And so where we'd like to say, oh, well, I'm, I'm impervious to peer pressure, and in contrast to that are those people pleasers, just like I was talking about with time and people above, the reality is it's just as likely that saying I'm impervious to peer pressure is a good way of saying I actually don't have very much empathy. Uh, you know, um, so I did, when I was in, when I was in junior high school, uh, we had a, we had a session one night where we were doing a training uh, practice for speech and debate, speech and debate tournament. And I was getting ready to debate and my partner was there and our coach was there and everything was good. And then our coach had some kind of crisis come up. Somebody called somebody in his family who was facing some kind of crisis. He had to leave and there was no other adult there. And so he just left and said, now you guys can handle this. And this was a, a fairly responsible group of kids, you would have thought. Uh, but as it turns out, the minute he was gone, the rowdier kids among the others uh, of us, and that's not me, as it turns out, I'm not just self-serving in saying that, uh, they started going from one classroom to the next throughout the entire building. And I mean, jumping around and, you know, climbing over desks and knocking things over, and it was insane. I've never seen anything. I, I just thought, what is wrong with these monsters? And they went off and played in the building, and I just left. I just walked out. I'm like, they were. They wanted me to come and join with them. I'm, like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So they all they all got suspended from the team, as it turns out, because somehow or another, they, somebody found out it wasn't me. I, I didn't turn them in. But it was obvious. I mean, they damaged some things in the building. So they all got kicked off the team and, 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 and come to find out some of them told the truth about what I did. That, you know, well, he just walked out. <laughs> so uh, my mom found out about that. And I remember her saying to me how proud she was that I was impervious to peer pressure and that I'd always been that way and all that kind of stuff. And it was a really nice compliment. And I've always held on to that. You know, you can tell by me saying it now, you know, however many years later, 47 years later, uh, that I would still say, well, that, that meant a lot to me in that moment. At the same time, I wonder, looking back, uh, if if a lot of that wasn't just based on the fact that I have a slightly undersized amygdala, you know, uh, part of that. Some, some, so I read something or, or heard some study somewhere or something, I can't remember where it came from, about a relationship between human empathy and the amygdala. I don't know where I heard it. I wish I could remember. Uh, but I have seen it confirmed, in, you know, just looking it up and things like that, that there's some relationship between that part of the brain and the characteristic of empathy, but it's, but it's just like so many different attributes. I'm bringing this up to say, it doesn't matter whether you say there are two kinds of people in the world, those who have a properly sized amygdala, part of the brain, and those who don't. Uh, even if you say that, it's not like I've said to myself, oh, you know, it's okay that I'm not empathetic because, you know, my amygdala is a little messed up. No, I mean, what I do is say, wow, I, I need to focus on being empathetic with people. Uh, I'm not I'm not recommending the movie. I don't remember enough of it to say whether it would be good or not. Uh, but the movie Gattaca, you know, made this point, And there was some quote at the end of it. There's no gene for the human spirit. I don't remember exactly how it puts the quote up there. But it's something like that. It says there's no gene for the human spirit. And that's sort of the point of the whole movie. It's a, it's a really interesting discussion about this idea that we're determined by our physical characteristics. Which, by the way, the movie doesn't really philosophically sufficiently 
uh, deny or reject. But it, it does make an interesting point, and it's a point that I think is valid, that there is something about the human spirit that can reshape us. So I, I may not be good at running, but I can still run, and I can work on improving my running. Uh, I may not have a, a body design that's shaped for playing basketball, but I could still improve my basketball skills. And in the same way, I may not have an amygdala that's inclined to make me empathetic with people, but I can still work on my empathy, and I do. I work on it all the time. I work constantly to make sure that I'm paying attention to where the people are coming from and why they're coming from there and how it would make sense for them to come from there, and we can all do that. So so there's an example. So I've given one example. Let's see if we can hit two or three more here before we run out of time. It's, it's the weirdest thing. I, I prepare these episodes, and I think I'll, I, I barely have enough information, and then I end up with two or three shows out of one, one set of preparation. I don't, I don't know what's wrong. Maybe you're just not listening fast enough. We're working on it, though. Let's, uh, let's give another example. So let's talk about the context of the self just the way we we see ourselves. I did a whole series on this, so I'll run through this one really quickly. Uh, Episodes 17 through 19. By the way, we're on episode 51 at this point. We've done 51 episodes in this podcast. Uh, But anyway, uh, this is, and that that series was called Disagreeing to Agree. I I hope you got to listen to it. But uh, it's the difference between individualists and communitarians. So there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who see themselves primarily as an individual in a society or against a society, and then those who see themselves as formed by that society and only with a meaningful existence in their community, in their society. So other people would use the word collectivist. I don't think that's quite the right word. So I use the word communitarian instead. But there's a risk at that too, but I'm, you can listen to that episode and figure out why that is. So anyway, the point here is that uh, for individualists, that's, that's where most of us are as Americans in our, in our way of thinking of ourselves. So this is about individual liberties and rights, and I have the, you know, and so on. And when you start thinking in a more communitarian way, those who are more communitarian would think primarily in terms of obligations and my connections uh, with other people. And the advantage, obviously, in a communitarian mindset is valuing others. The, the advantage in an individualist mindset is responsibility, that you take responsibility for yourselves. You, you, you recognize the importance of answering to your own conscience. So there's value on both sides, obviously. There's no problem with that. Uh, but it's the, you know, the, I had a recent discussion with a surgeon, a trauma surgeon uh, uh, up in Nashville. A really smart guy. He'd be, he'd be really fun to have on the on the uh, on the show sometime, but uh, but and not from a Christian perspective. We were talking because I taught bioethics for a good while, and he teaches bioethics also. Uh, I think in a medical school environment where he is. So anyway, um, I, I actually know that I'm just trying not to be too specific about who it was, so I'm not you know speaking out of term. But anyway, we had a really interesting discussion about physician obligations because you know a physician's obligation is to his patient and not just primarily to his patient, but, you know, a lot of times you, you want to say morally it's just to your patient. You have to focus only on the patient. But we were talking about the case where you have a patient who comes in and, and they're your patient, but there's no way for them to live. They are dying. So, for instance, their brain has been destroyed or whatever, and there's nothing you can do to save them, but you want to hook them up to a machine so their family has time to get there and say goodbye to them, or uh, you want to preserve their organs for someone else. But in, in, de- in making decisions like that, you're inherently making decisions that aren't in the interest of the patient. They're not about the patient. They're about the patient's family or they're about the organ uh, donor recipient, I mean, the organ recipient. Uh, And so, you know, the idea that you're acting on their behalf or acting in behalf of what they would say or something like that is just not present because they're dying. But in reality, in that moment we were talking about this, the, the, the true nature of that person is that they're not just an individual. They're an individual that's a part of a community. And it is in that individual's interest that their family be able to come and say goodbye to them. And, and, and presumably, normally, they would care about that also if they could express their wishes. And in the same way, if we were slightly more communitarian in our thinking about our own identity, even being an organ donor, having checked the box on the back of your driver's license means you understand I'm part of a community that goes beyond my existence that actually is a part of my existence. And I want to be a part of that community. Just acknowledging that, or uh, for instance, the idea of church discipline, that 
that when we are a part of a community, when we recognize the, the significance of, of being a part of a community, then church discipline means something. When you say church discipline means when you say to someone, you're not going to be able to be a member of this congregation because you're not living right, you're not doing the right thing. That's really disturbing to us. It feels cultic to us because we're so individualistic. But, you know, in, in, in the New Testament, it was a common practice, but it was a common practice that worked because people were communitarian. They could not sense what it would mean to be a full person without the community giving you definition, giving you shape to your morality and so on. And so for them, church discipline made sense in that way. That's a communitarian way of thinking. But in, in actuality, there aren't individualists and communitarians. There are just people who prioritize individualism over their community existence, and there are people who prioritize uh, community, community over individualists, but they're in different cultures, the ones who do that. And so in actuality, though, there are those who deny or are blind to communitari our communitarian nature, and on the other side, there are those who are suppressing or repressing the individualistic nature that we have. And if we could talk about it historically, which I, I don't, I'm not going to take time to do right now, but I would point out the huge transition that takes place in the American psyche between the, 1800, between the year 1800 and the year 1900, during the 19th century. Because at the beginning of that century, even though the ph philosophical bent and the statements of our founding documents, for instance, are all individualistic completely, the reality of the human psyche was still completely sociologically communitarian. We were committed to an understanding of our community existence. Uh, for instance, there were no laws against uh, beating your wife. There were no laws against how, you, you know, how a husband treated his wife. But there was tremendous community pressure against men who treated their wives poorly. And so a person could be excluded from their neighborhood, from the neighborhood barbecue. And you would say, well, what, a, what a weak response to a man you know, abusing a woman. But if you're communitarian, it's a response that actually works sometimes. Not, I'm not saying it worked often or that it was sufficient, but it was a response that actually meant something to us because we had that sense at the beginning of the 19th century. By the end of the 19th century, we were much more thoroughly ensconced, even at the, at the ground level, meaning street by street, we were much more ensconced in an individualistic, libertarian, rights-based sense of who we are. I'm going to choose my own way. People were making their own religious choices from one generation to the next and career choices from one generation to the next. It's the reason the idea of just handing down your craft or your store or whatever from father to, ch to son to, to grandson and so on has diminished so much because we have much greater sense of individualism than communitarianism in our way of thinking. It's the same thing with the evolution of, of childhood discipline. You know, when you're a communitarian, you're thinking, yeah, if a, if a kid gets out of line, you beat them back into shape because they need to fit in the community or they're not even going to grow up to be an individual. It's not just a matter of, oh, we've become softer and we're such snowflakes that we can't handle a little pain for a child. It's not just that. It's the reality that we, we have a much higher priority on individuals being able to express the full range of their individuality all the way beyond the existential limits that you would think would go with gender and so on like that. Those are just a, another expression of saying, well, I don't want to suppress the individual that's trying to get out of my child when they're screaming and kicking against me because I'm trying to feed them oatmeal instead of Snicker bars. Not, not that a toddler eats Snicker bars, but you get the idea. Close enough. So all of that has to do with the idea that there are two different kinds of selves, those who are individualistic, those who are communitarian, while we ought to acknowledge the reality that all of us are both individuals and communitarians, we're both committed to, we're all committed to both sides of our nature, we just like to, we just like to disguise one of them or close our eyes to one side of it until it's convenient for us. And again, I had that whole discussion in the disagreeing to agree, especially the third episode of that, that I would encourage you to go listen to if you want to resolve that one and, and sort of understand the wrench in the works about that discussion. Uh, another context. Let's take another context. In this case, it's sort of a myopic context. That is where we measure the categories of the world solely about us. <laughs> so I can see no further than the end of my nose. And so when I do see someone else, all I really want to know is, are they like me or are they not like me? You know, there are two kinds of people in the world, those who are like me and those who are not like me. So when I'm talking about those, I mean, we could talk about anything. You could talk about natives and outsiders, those who were born here, 
not from around these parts, are you, boy? You know, that kind of expression. We still, my producer sitting across the room from me right here, Daisy, she's from Oregon. Uh, she still faces the occasional wrath of those of us who were born in Texas. Uh, she will say something, and we will all look askance at her like, uh, oh, yeah, you're from Oregon, aren't you? There's something different about you. Uh, we do. We have a natural tendency to look at people who grew up where we grew up and say they understand all of our customs, they understand all of the norms that we have, and those who are outsiders, well, you're just never going to get it. You're not really from around here. It doesn't matter how long you live here, you're never going to be one of us. As, as uh, you know, as much as I would never want to be that way, it's in human nature that we are that way. We categorize those who are natives or outsiders. Uh, and that, that's what happens a lot with immigrants and foreigners, too. It's not always loathing or fear that brings it about, but it is always this sense of advantage that you have because you know all the ins and outs of people who were raised here, who were born here, and so on like that. So the insider-outsider kind of thing, the native or immigrant kind of thing on one hand. But, you know, even beyond that, I grew up uh, around the athlete bookworm division. You know, there were all the, the athletes over there, and then there were there were those of us who went to the, to the pep rallies and diagrammed sentences during the pep rally, and that's what we did. My little group, we wrote the most complicated sentence we could think of at the end of our speech class. We would write this super complicated sentence because pep rally was coming next, and, you know, it wasn't like we were going to go to the game. So we would sit in the stands while everybody around us was participating in the pep rally, and we would have this giant piece of paper where we were all working on the same sentence together, diagramming it to see how, you know, what's subordinate to what and so on like that. And that's fun stuff with grammar, by the way. If you're not in if you're in it, you're in it. If you're not, you're not. You know, two kinds of people, right? Or among the bookworms, those who were math-minded, those who were literature-minded. Because, you know, if you're an engineer, math-minded person, you know that literature people are just loosey-goosey. I mean, they don't really know anything. They just enjoy their feelings. And if you're, and that's me pretending to be judgmental about it. In reality, I learned much later in college uh, that I needed to gain an appreciation for real literature and how it was uh, how, how how it impacted human beings and so on. So I have learned that. So you know, two categories of people. But I'm trying to say in this case, not all of those individual categories I was just naming, but simply those who are like me, you know, math-minded, bookworm, native, because I live where I grew up. Uh, and then those outsiders, those other people who are you know whatever they are. So there are those who are like you and those who are not. In reality, though, the, the, the truth that we have this innate desire to fit in may deceive us. And so I'm not, I, this is not the same thing, but it's similar or it's a parallel to it. You, you know what imposter syndrome is, right? So, uh, and, and I think I've heard this a good bit lately, so I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with what it is. But it's that sense that people have when they're you know, when they're afraid they're going to be found out as an imposter. So uh, I remember when I became a professor, when I first became a professor. I've been a pastor for 20 years by this point. I had a Ph.D. in philosophy and in, in, in the area of humanities in, in the disciplines of philosophy and history. Had enough graduate hours to teach in philosophy or history, uh, you know, sans phrase. So I, 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 was, I was qualified. And yet, when I walked into the classroom, it's like, oh, some student's going to ask a question. Some professor is going to pass me in the hall and make some joke, and they're going to go, he didn't get that. I don't, I don't think he should be a professor. He's a fake. We need to get rid of this guy, and then UTA is going to rescind my PhD, and then everybody's going to know I'm a total fraud, and my entire life's going to fall apart, and I had that sense. And I try to encourage, by the way, I try to encourage young or new professors now and say to them, you, you don't have to know everything. You don't need to know the stuff you don't know. You know enough stuff that you got a PhD, teach that. Don't teach the other stuff. Don't pretend you know the other stuff. You don't need to. Learn the other stuff as you go along. And the difference in the classroom is huge, by the way. When you get a professor who's confident enough to say, you know, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. Oh, I'll have to read that book. I haven't read that yet. But I have read these other ones, you know. It's not like you can't know anything. Anyway, the point is, imposter syndrome is, sim is, is similar to this. Uh, very often, you know, even as a native, even as a person from here, the reality that we're trying so hard to fit in with everybody else who is a native from here, everybody else who's like us, really makes us people who are trying to be a part of the group that's like us. But in reality, we're trying to be like them. And so we're becoming something we're not so that we can say, oh, those people are just like me. When in reality, we're just trying to make ourselves like those people. Churches can be 
petri dishes of this. They can be petri dishes of micro homogeneity. You know what I mean? Not just similar in some ways, but similar in these microscopic ways without any intentionality to it at all. We welcome everyone. I love it when churches say that. We welcome everyone. Well, you, you would welcome anyone who showed up, but what you actually welcome are the people who approach you and say, oh, that's like me. That's like me. Oh, I'm comfortable here. And so in reality, we welcome everyone who feels like they're going to be welcomed when they realize what we are. That's what you're really welcoming, and so you can either be aware of what that is or not, but either way, churches become this perfect model of it, and I'm bringing up churches because I've been in a bajillion churches. That's my second use of the word bajillion today, I'm saying, but anyway, I've been in a lot of churches, and I've seen it over and over again, not in any malicious way. I've never seen it in a malicious way. That's not true. I've seen it in a racist way on occasion and deliberately. But I'm not talking about that kind of thing here. I'm talking about the unintentional ways. And that was rare. That's not often, but it, but it is present. But in those unintentional ways, in what others would say are implicit biases, and what I would say are implicit biases, it does come to race sometimes in this as well. So I'm not excluding that. But this is not about that. This is just pointing out that I mean, you know, you go into a church and you, can, you look at it and you say, oh, wow, if you're looking at this as an outsider, As you approach this building, you may be like them or not, but you can tell there's a certain kind of vehicle that's going to be there. There's a certain attire, a certain hairstyle, certain demeanors, even the looks on the faces I'm talking about with the demeanors, certain hobbies, certain career interests, certain family structures. I'm not saying everybody's the same age, but they're all fitting in that same pattern of a family structure, even if they're at different phases of their life, and they all align. And I'm not saying they wouldn't welcome someone who doesn't align, and of course, it's speckled in the sense that there's that one guy who has a weird hairstyle, or that one person who wears shorts when they go down the aisle, or you know, whatever it is. But everybody else, the nature of the church is this super micro-homogenous group. It's like, if we were talking about milk, not just milk instead of Coke, you know, do you, do you have milk or do you have Coke? Uh, but homogenized, pasteurized, 1% milk fat, lactose-free, non-GMO milk from free-range Holsteins, you go in this church over here, and those of you who are homogenized, pasteurized, 1% milk fat, lactose-free, non-GMO milk from free-range jerseys, you go in that church over there. It's like that, and, and we're not even aware of it. We just You just go in and you see it. That's me saying to you, this is how good we are at categorizing people, even if we're not intending to, into those who are like us and those who are not like us. Or, inversely, this is the wrench in the works, making ourselves like a certain kind of people and not like a certain kind of other people. Our awareness of that can really help us understand where we are bridging to other groups of people and not bridging to other groups of people. Let me give you another context. Uh, We're almost done here. Uh, This one, the context of the fall. By the fall, I mean our nature as human beings that are approaching death, right? (laughs) So, I mean, from the moment we're born, we're we're all approaching death. And I I don't mean this in a depressing or cynical way, but there are those who are, they spend every day of their lives mitigating our fall toward death right? So every day they're working on healthy eating and healthy habits and self-discipline, and I'm making, I'm mitigating the decline of my life. Some people do it in that way. I'm pursuing health no matter what. Other people do it in ways that are, that are not as holistic, you know, I would say. Uh, so maybe they're using plastic surgery. I'm not criticizing that. I would in some senses for myself because I uh, would criticize myself for doing it because I know my motives wouldn't be right. Other people, I don't care. Whatever you figure out, you figure out. Uh, but my point is, whether it's through plastic surgery or through, uh, you know, a whole lot of cover-up, I, I, like I had a good friend whom I loved, and she's passed away many, many, many years ago. But even as an 80-something, an octogenarian, uh, she was having a hard time acknowledging that she was an older woman. And so she was constantly trying to act as if and dress as if, and, you know, in general, fashion herself as if she were still in her 30s. And I do mean in her 30s. A really fine person. And that was the only thing about her. I, I just always wanted to say, oh, you know, it's okay that you're older. We love you being older. You're a really 
elegant woman at this age. You, do, you don't need to pretend to be something you're not. So there are people who mitigate along those ways as well. So those, those people, you know, the ones who are trying to make their life completely ordered and everything's in control and it's not a problem. In a fallen world, you can understand why I'm using the word mitigators. Uh, there are people who are sort of undermining the nature of our humanity to propel towards death from the moment we're born, right? So the womb and tomb kind of idea. And then there are the other category, right? So we're talking two kinds of people all the time. There are the self-destroyers, you know, those who are self-saboteurs. Uh, I think those are the ones who are Proverbs fool. Uh, I think that's what the word means. Not the, it's not a, you know, a, a court jester type fool in the book of Proverbs or throughout Scripture. I think a fool is a person who's, who's destroying himself. And so uh, Luke's rich man is a fool because he says in his heart, you have much goods laid up for many years. Now eat, drink, and be merry. But he's, but he's in actuality propelling himself toward the grave and, and not mitigating the consequences of the fall at all, preparing for eternity in any way and so on like that. And uh, there, are, there are a bunch of different examples we could give of that. I, I wish I could take a long time to talk about this part. You know, it's uh, the self-destroyers, uh, you know, have made choices that are harming them and rushing them towards death instead of slowing our progress toward death. And all of us have people like that in our lives that we deal with. We're trying to help them, and, and they just, you know, they, they refuse to hold on to our hands. They refuse to be pulled out of the pit or whatever it is that we're, that we're trying to do to help. And it's, it's really frustrating to, to see a person act like that. But, but in reality, Ecclesiastes 2 brings us a little closer to each other, those two groups to each other. So this is the wrench I'll throw in this, in this works. Uh, that there is, this is Ecclesiastes 2, there's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Uh, this is likely what the author of, what, what Luke has in mind when he's describing this person who's rich when Jesus gives the parable about the rich man. Eat, drink, and be merry. Because he says right after this in Ecclesiastes, this also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him who can eat or who can have enjoyment. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he's given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who does please God. This is also vanity and striving after wind. Uh, all of this effort we make to aggrandize for ourselves is only meaningful in the hand of God anyway. So all the stuff we're doing to mitigate death in one sense and all the stuff we're doing to rush towards it in the other sense so we can enjoy life on the way to it all puts us in that same category that we all find level footing at the tomb, as the proverb describes it also. You know, in, in the grave, the rich and the poor are brought together. Also the wise and the fool. I mean, we all do die at the end of the day. That sort of mitigates the claim that we make, that there are two kinds of people, or, or the way we'd like to prejudice one people against another. And I'm not saying there's not a value in mitigating our approach toward death. I'm not saying that, but we would have to talk more about it in another episode. Uh, here's, the, here's the point I'm getting at. In the, in the most important context, the most important context of all, is about the, the way we see our purpose, the purpose that we have in life. So about the self, for instance, uh, there are people who believe that their entire lives are for them. Uh, you know, I remember being in high school and being mad at my parents one day and driving by the house and thinking in a car, by the way, that was provided by them and thinking, man, I, I, I wish I could just, I wish I could just make it on my own. I wish I just didn't need them. And then and immediately thinking to myself, and I wish I could just drive off in this car that they gave me and the money with the gas that, that, that they provided the money for and with the, you know, and the job that my dad got for me uh, and so on like that and, and realizing how foolish it was for me to think that I could manage my independence at that time. But someday, you know, I would get there and realizing that even that was false. You know, none of us are ever independent like that. You're, there was an old Twilight Zone or maybe a night gallery uh, about a, a guy that wanted to be alone, and he just wanted to read. He was a bookworm. He just wanted to read, and 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 people just kept disturbing him. And, oh, if he, if he could just be alone, and then and then there's an apocalypse. I can't remember a nuclear war or whatever. Back from that day, it had to be a nuclear war, and the entire world was destroyed, and there was nobody but him and books everywhere because it was a library that he had been in, and and so he was going to have his entire not no people and books and oh hallelujah, and then he broke his glasses. And the point, you know, that the, of course, the episode is about more. In Twilight Zone and Night Gallery, you know, Rod Serling, they had a, it had a serious social justice sort of emphasis to the shows. I mean, that was the whole point. 
I'm not saying it wasn't entertaining. It was. But, you know, in the message, obviously, he needed somebody to make him glasses, and he didn't have anybody now. And so you need those people that you don't want. But even beyond that, he wanted to spend his life reading books that had been written by other people. That's the point of reading books. There is no escape from our dependency on other people. And then there are people who who commit themselves. We're going to say there are two kinds of people, the narcissists who are all, only about themselves, and then the people who are about others. And this is the way we talk about our prospective students at Criswell. Uh, we are looking for students who know that their entire lives and careers are to be given away to God and the people he sent us to love. Not, not have a career for ourselves, but to have a career we can give away to others. That's how we talk about them. Uh, Paul puts it this way in Philippians 2, not just about certain categories of people, but about all believers. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but on the interests of others. In other words, he's saying, have a mind like Christ's. In reality, everyone's life is, whether we acknowledge it or not, it is about others. The only question is whether we're swimming with the current or against it. If I could spend a long time on this, I would, but I'll just say it briefly. I mean, for instance, independent wealth people talk about. Wealth only has meaning if there are people from whom you can use your wealth to purchase things. That's the only time it has meaning. Uh, David Hume recognized this when he talked about the way nations saw themselves aggrandizing wealth. doesn't matter how wealthy you are as a nation if nobody else has something you want to buy from them. Uh, And even the most introverted people, and I'm an introvert, even the most introverted people need other people from which to withdraw and find rest. Otherwise, time alone would simply become empty, and that's all there would be. And most importantly, it's why the great commandment stands above all the others, not by accident, but by its nature, not arbitrarily. Well, let me pick one important commandment. Let's take that one. It's not like that. Loving God means knowing we exist for something greater. Loving others means knowing we exist for others which are greater not by virtue of their individual nature, but because they are beyond the narrow limits of the self. They are greater than us. They are beyond us. They are outside of us. That's what makes it so important to lay down our lives for them. And so let me just end this way. If there are two kinds of people in the world, you know, those who are like you and those who are not, those who are right and those who are wrong, those who are blessed and those who are cursed, if there are two kinds of people in the world, if there are, then love both. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Cream. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.